I've heard it continually said that we live in a, with a generation of entitlement. But I've been thinking a lot about that, and as we're going through the scriptures, I think that has always been our problem. And I don't think that that's really isolated in any one area. We like to place it in different areas. So I'd like for us today just to think about this word entitlement. We just sang a song. Our God is alive. In Him we live. In Him we survive. He created us. He created everything. Let's pray about that. Father God, you are sovereign. And we come before you, Father God, as your people. Father, just asking you, Father God, just to humble us. To break us down, Father God, to be able to see you on that throne as we sung about. That we see your robe and we see, see your concern and your love and all the things that you've done for us. We pray, Father God, as your people, that we step out of ourselves, Father. And we really think about who you are. Not who we are. Not what we deserve. Not about others. But who we are in relationship to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we get started, I'd like us to watch a little video. I deserve a job after graduation because I earned it. I deserve a job because I pay a lot of money to go to college. I am entitled to a job because I, you know, I've worked hard and gone to school. Do you deserve a job after you graduate? Well, Absolutely. You deserve I deserve it. I'm in grad school now. An employer owes me a good job, decent benefits so that I can live, and health insurance. A little over $25 an hour. Thirty to 40000 a year. At least 40000 Oh, at least 60,000. 70 to 80,000 a year. Like 100 grand, yeah. I deserve seven figures per year. At the Rocky Board. I am an employer. I am an employer. I am an employer, and I have jobs. Good jobs. Good jobs. And I'm hiring. But if you want to work for me, you need to know how I really feel. You see, I am entitled. I am entitled. I am entitled. I'm entitled to you arriving here to the job on time. Every day until the very last minute of your shift. And if you're scheduled at nine. And arrive at nine. You're late. I am entitled to you being positive and enthusiastic as you approach the task you are assigned. Regardless of what they are. Or anything that may have happened to you before you came to work. I get it. I have no right to say how you dress communicate or act on your own time. However, while you're at work, I'm entitled to you being a professional. And acting and speaking like one. Showing up dressed and groomed in a way that best represents this organization. And the image that we need to project to our clients and to the world. I'm entitled to you doing the work. You are paid to do to the very best of your ability. And then some. The only way this business is going to grow and provide opportunity for you to grow with it is if you're continually looking for ways to excel, achieve, solve problems, and add value whenever and wherever you can. I'm entitled to your respect for my rules, whether or not you agree with them. I want you to enjoy working here and like your managers. But that's not a condition of your willingness to follow company policies. I am entitled to the truth. And yes, I can handle the truth. So if you're not ill, please don't call in sick. If you handle money or merchandise, every cent must be accounted for. If you lie, cheat, steal, fudge, or hook a buddy up, even once, the trust I need to have in you will forever be in question. But it's our customers who are even more entitled. They're the ones who pay our wages and keep this business running. That entitles them to fast, friendly, and courteous service from everyone in this organization. So you need to go out of your way to show them how much we appreciate their business. 
So if you agree to this list of entitlements, then you're not only entitled to a paycheck. You're entitled to me living up to these same high standards. But hey, if you feel like we're asking for too much, then you're entitled to look for another employer that will not ask these things of you. But the odds of you finding one aren't good. Who is our employer? Who's our customers? I know it's a little commercial, but who's our customers? The people in the world. Then who is really entitled? Entitlement. It's our biggest problem. All of ours. Not just the ones that we want to tag entitlement. That person thinks he's entitled. But so do the rest of us. Is it something new? Is it really this generation? This is a generation of entitlements? I don't think so. Last week, we saw the parable of the two sons. If you remember the story, the one son said, oh, I'm not going to go to work because he thought he was entitled just to be there. The other son said, oh, yeah, Dad, I'm going to go. But he never showed. The one son who said, I'm not going to go, he repented. And he came and he went to work. Because something happened in his mind that he realized he needed to do that. The problem with both of them was entitlement. This lesson is being given directly to religious leaders. And Jesus goes on with the same thought in Matthew 21, but this time with a little bit more. Direction. This week, Jesus is packing a punch. He's not pulling up the style. He's not softly going to tell him. He's going to tell him. In Matthew 21, 33 to 46, if you care to turn there, And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, I say to you, if you have faith... Oh, I'm sorry, I started in 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landlord who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to the vine growers. And went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and they beat one and they killed another and they stoned the third. Again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first. And they did the same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, Hey, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will, be, what, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent the vineyard to, to other vine growers who will pay him for the proceeds at, a pro, at the proper season. Jesus said to them, did you never read in scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, 
the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing fruit of it. This parable is pinned directly to the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. They would have understood this parable completely. Because this whole parable is just a reiteration of scripture that they would already know. Therefore, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious people of that time would have known exactly who Jesus was talking to. If you turn with me to Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, Let me now sing, sing now, for my beloved, a song on my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, and he dug in it all around and removed its stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine, and he built a tower in the middle of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its walls, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it in waste, and I will not, it will not be pruned or hoed. But briars and thorns will come up, and I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts in the house of Israel and the men of Judah is delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for the righteous. But behold, a cry of distress. See, this parable a little bit different than the rest of the parables is really not Jesus coming up with his own story. Jesus just quoted what they already knew. It wasn't isolated. He pointed it directly at them, and they would understand that. He hit them with a punch. In Isaiah 5, 2, and he dug it all around, removed his stones, planted it, with the choicest vine, and he built a tower in it, in the middle of it, and hewed out the vine, hewed out a wine vat in it. There was a, and in Matthew 21, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press and in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers. It's identical. Who? Who owned the vineyard? Who owned the vineyard? I can't hear you. God owned the vineyard. Who provided the protection? Can't hear you. God. Come on, you can say it. He's alive. He wants to hear it. God. Who warned them? God. Who provided the crop? God. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. He sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. But there wasn't. They killed, they killed the slaves. Why? 
What? What does God expect from his vineyard? Good fruit. For who? For him. Who's entitled to it? Who owns the vineyard? I mean, not the, not the guy, the, land, the, the occupants, the tenants? No. What did he get from them? Bad fruit. What was the result? He closed, he, he, he burned down his vineyard. Or in Matthew, he gives it to somebody else. Why? Entitlement. They had the wrong understanding of entitlement. This parable is also pinned to his church. Us. Uh oh. I thought he was only talking about the Pharisees and the scribes. It had nothing to do with me. What's his kingdom now? What's his vineyard now? The church. What's his vineyard supposed to produce? Good fruit. Who's entitled that we should get, he should get that good fruit? Who? Built the church. The people that came here, let's just say Homestead Congregation, but that's obviously not his church. The church is much larger. The people that came here in 1970, did they build his church? Who provides the protection? God. Who gives salvation? God. Who keeps warning us? God. What does he expect? What does he expect? This lesson is pretty simple. He expects what? Good fruit. You will know them by their fruits. How does God know who's his? By their fruits. What does he expect from each one of us? Fruit. We were talking about it in class today. What do we keep on needing to do? We need to keep growing in his word so that we can produce what? Fruit. We are to keep preaching the word in season and out of season. But how do we do that? we got to know his word. And we got to be living out his word. For I planted, God makes the increase. I mean, I planted, Apollos watered, but God makes the increase. In John 15, 1 to 8, Jesus writes this. He says, I am the true vine. He's the vineyard. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. Are you getting the idea? We're supposed to be bearing fruit. You are already clean because the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. I need to be walking every day knowing I'm in Christ. I'm not going to bear fruit. Everything I do, as we talked about in class today, needs to be in line with that plumb line 
and reflected on what would Christ do in that situation. Or we're not going to bear good fruit. We're going to produce worthless fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch. If I'm thrown away, that means I once was part of the vineyard. And dries up. And they gathered them. And they cast them into the fire. And they, they are burned. If you abide in me, and in my words, abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and that shall be done for you. But if I want things done for me, what do I have to do? I have to abide in his Word. By this, my Father is glorified that we walk and talk and act out His Word. I have that you bear much fruit, so to prove to be my disciples. Those are strong words. This is not a spectator sport. It becomes a spectator sport when I think that I'm entitled. See, that's what, the, what happened with the Pharisees. They thought they were entitled. That's what happened to the Israelites. They thought they were entitled. That's what's happening in our world and our churches. We think that we're entitled. We're entitled. Are we? Everyone who has been given much shall much be required. Much be required. There's too many muches there, but you can't overdo much. Okay? Because he expects much from us. Not a little drop in the bucket. It's like we saw in that video. Bosses expected a lot from their employees. But my employee, your employee, is God. Do we give as much to God as we do to our own employees at work? Do we give as much time and effort and sweat to God? Or do we give more to the person we're hired by? Who gave me that job? God. Are we entitled to be here? I don't think so. To have our own seats? Are we entitled to that? Yes, I am. To have a clean building. Is this an entitlement? Of course. I deserve that. To be part of his vineyard? Am I entitled to be part of his church? His kingdom? Are we entitled to having Bibles? Singing praises? To worship him? To serve him? To be part of his ministry? Here for us? And in RCA? Are we entitled to that? Are we entitled to go to heaven? Yes! I've been a Christian for 40 years now. I've come to church every single day. Well, you can't go to church, number one. I sat in the pews and I sang a few songs. I did go home and cuss out my neighbor, though. Because I wanted to bear good fruit. For that matter, are we entitled to anything? I've come to the conclusion we're not. We're not entitled to anything. And that's our problem. We think we're entitled to things. We're not entitled to anything. Everything we have was given to us by God, and everything was given to us by God was given to us for God. If I have a house that He blessed me with, Whose house is it? If I have a truck out there, 
Can you use it if you've got to go pick up some trash? Of course you can. It's not my truck. It belongs to who? God. If I have a quarter in my pocket and you don't have any, what do I need to give you? My quarter. It's not mine anyway. I'm not entitled to it. I'm entitled, I've been asked, to give good fruit because my God is entitled to that. He has given me everything. No. It's a big no. Whenever you think you deserve something, you need to have this big no come up in your brain. And that's what Jesus is telling the Pharisees here. That's why they were put out. They thought it was their nation. We think this is our congregation. We think this is our church. We think this is our building. We think this is our house. We think it's, everything is ours. Nothing is ours. That's what we signed up for when we came to work in his vineyard. We walked out of the waters of baptism and we said, here we are. We're a new creation resurrected with you to serve you. Somewhere along the line, we went back to serving ourselves. Why? Because we think we're entitled to it. If I get up tomorrow morning, I'm not entitled to get up tomorrow morning. It's a gift. The Pharisees, they thought entitlement. Entitlement is not something new. And if entitlement is getting stronger in our society, then there's something wrong with the church. Because it's not affecting the society to make them realize that it's God. That's why Jesus came to change everything. For the only he, God, is entitled to anything. He's the only one that deserves anything. And we give it to him because we need to accept everything we have as a blessing and an honor. See, God has blessed us with every spiritual gift. God has blessed us with this building. I can remember meeting in hotel rooms. This is a blessing. This is not an albatross. RCA is a blessing. We get to talk to kids every day about Jesus. It's a blessing. It's not a hardship. When there's paper on the ground, it's a blessing to be able to go and pick it up and throw it in the garbage can. Because we're Christians. Jesus is telling this to the Pharisees because his heart's being poured out to him. He's not saying it to him because he's mad. He wants them to understand it. Because if they don't understand it, or if we don't understand the blessings that we have been given, we're going to be left out. Is what Jesus is trying to tell us. It's what he's trying desperately to tell the Pharisees. That's why this time when he wrote the parable, he gave it back to them in their very own language. It's going to die. You've got to get it. Remember when he's coming into Jerusalem, he said, I'd like to gather you all up. He wept. He cried. Because they didn't get it. They suffered from entitlement. 
Our world suffers from entitlement because in the church, I think entitlement is a big issue also. When was the last time we thanked God that we had air conditioning? When was the last time we thanked God we had a pew to sit in? When was the last time you thanked God that you could be in this building? When was the last time you thanked God that you could talk to a child here five days a week and reach to their families? I want you to come forward when we sing.